Coming up, Cygnus completes its mission. SpaceX is set to return to flight. We look back on 2016 and upcoming 2017. All that and more. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to Tomorrow 9.39. Ben is currently behind the camera and doing things like this, so totally not distracting in any way, shape, or form. I do want to make sure that everyone who has contributed $10 or more to this particular segment of this particular show gets a huge thank you from me, because I'm the only one on camera. So, <laughs> this is actually coming from, of course, all of us here at TMRO, pronounced tomorrow. These are the people who, like I said, have, have uh, given usually these people have given us more than just their money. They've given us their time and their love and affection. So I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you these people also get uh, uh, chances to get into our Slack channel, which is really very, I'll talk about distracting thing, but it's a really great place to get to know <laughs> the inside track of what's going on on tomorrow. Also joining me on air right now is, a, I have a Jared and I have a Mike. There we are. And Ben Higginbotham, of course, will be joining us a little bit later on in the show. And that's the camera that I'm supposed to be looking at. So here we are. In any case, we do have a couple of launches since last time we were on air. Uh, I, I don't even know what the first one is. It looks like it's an Atlas V. Oh, this is the Gozer. I love this launch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at some footage. <laughs> Two, one. And liftoff of NOAA's goes R, America's most advanced weather eye in the sky. So this launch took place on Thursday, November 19th at 2342 Coordinated Universal Time from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And this satellite is uh, its an acronym for the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, R. Now, once it reaches orbit, and that shot right there of seeing the payload actually be deployed is just beautiful. I've never seen something like that. But once the satellite becomes operational, it's actually going to be renamed GOES-16 uh, in the first uh, two months of its operation. And it's joining uh, uh, three other operational satellites that'll give us uh, the most advanced weather data that we've had to date. So uh, congratulations to the United Launch Alliance for that successful launch and to NASA and the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for uh, hope hopefully collecting better data than we've ever had before. Good job on those acronyms, yeah. Mike. Appreciate that. Fantastic. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, kind of stuttered there on the Noah one. I had to. Uh, uh, it's get it all out. of those Sorry. A's. There's just so many of them, and they can mean anything. Um, yeah. All right, and we had another one. This, this one came from. Is this China? Yes, this was a Chinese launch. Let's okay. go ahead and check out the footage. This launch took place on Tuesday, November 22nd at 15.24 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhichang Space Center. And this particular satellite is the fourth geostationary data relay satellite in a series called Tianlian. And uh, Tianlian is kind of like NASA's tracking and data relay satellites or TDRS satellites. And that'll help them to be able to mitigate from space debris and, and uh, just be able to trap objects in space to avoid collisions. So uh, congratulations to China for that successful launch as well. Very. Oh, and by the way, this was a uh, Long March 3C rocket that uh, launched that rocket, which okay. is uh, the, the very toxic kind, and it only had two boosters on it. That's why somebody in the chat room is saying, don't breathe in the red smoke. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> a Long March 3C, because we've already gone over the Atlas V and, and what have you. Explain, what's the 3C or I don't know. I don't, I don't understand what this rocket is. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. So with the Long March rockets, um, the, the, the Long March 3 series of rockets, um, the, the letter designation at the end of it is uh, usually determines how many boosters they're going to fly with. Okay. Um, I believe that the 3A has no boosters at all. The 3B um, has uh, four boosters, and the 3C only has two boosters, if I'm remembering collect because correctly. I'm, that's I'm remembering this the off the top sense. of my head. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 that's totally fine. I, I, it's just <laughs> weird enough to be believable, if anything. Uh, I'm sure somebody in the, in the chat room will, will, uh, will let us know if you're wrong. Uh, okay, 
All right, good. Now I <laughs> know a little bit of something that 3C does not mean 3 or C doesn't mean 3 either. Perfect. <laughs> uh, all right, so there's also, there was a launch that was supposed to have happened that kind of happened. Yeah. Give, yeah, so, give, give um, me the bad news, Mike. So those other two launches were uh, when we were missing the show, but uh, this launch was a Soyuz launch, a Soyuz U launch that uh, launched a Progress spacecraft, but it unfortunately failed. So first, let's check out the launch footage. And liftoff. We have liftoff of the 65th Progress resupply vehicle beginning a two-day journey to the International Space Station. Now, this launched on uh, Thursday, December 1st at 1451 coordinated universal time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. However, six minutes and 23 seconds after launch, the mission control lost telemetry for the vehicle. And by this time, the third stage of the Soyuz rocket was firing, kind of like the, the animation that you see on screen there. Mm -hmm. And that firing of the third stage was supposed to last nine minutes, and then the spacecraft would separate from the third stage. However, they did not receive any confirmation of the stage separation. They did receive confirmation that the antennas on the Progress spacecraft did deploy, but not the solar panels. And then later on in the day, both the Progress vehicle and the third stage re-entered the atmosphere over the Tuva region in Russia and uh, exploded. So unfortunately, this uh, is, is a problem that they've been having with uh, the Soyuz third stage. Uh, this is actually really similar to the uh, accident that happened uh, last year with the uh, Progress M27M, is what its designation was, where they had a very really violent uh, separation. Doesn't look like it was that sort of case. It seems like that it, there wasn't a separation, and all the extra weight of the third stage might have been the reason why it, uh, you know, fell out of out of its uh, initial orbit, and, and really it had more of a suborbital flight instead of an actual orbital flight. Whoops. Um, yeah, but uh, they, they didn't receive any any more information from the Progress spacecraft. With the accident last year, we were able to see that cool footage of it spinning around and around and around in orbit and uh, before it finally uh, uh, re-entered the atmosphere a few days later. So they, the Russians don't know exactly why this accident happened. And they've, of course, uh, formed a state commission to look into this. But I do want to note that this was the second to last Soyuz U rocket that they were going to use. The Soyuz U rocket uses the really old avionics uh, uh, equipment that is analog. It's not digital. It's an analog system. And like I said, this was the second to last Soyuz U that they were going to use before moving over to their new Soyuz 2 vehicles, which do use a digital control system. And uh, I also do want to note that the uh, analog system was built in Ukraine. And uh, by the time that this particular unit was delivered to the Russians, all of the uh, um, drama over the Crimea, Crimea region was already happening. So this is just one more example of the decline of the Russian space industry and quality control issues not being uh, as effective as they should be. And thankfully, uh, the space station has plenty of food and plenty of supplies. They did lose a new uh, Orlan spacesuit for uh, EVAs and a couple of uh, Russian experiments as well, including a, a greenhouse experiment. But otherwise, uh, everyone at the station is safe, is fine, and they're going to be getting uh, a cargo flight uh, later on this month from the Japanese to hopefully uh, restore some of the water and food supplies. So as far as, the, as everyone at the station goes, everything is fine. But uh, uh, we will need another progress vehicle soon to help for reboost operations at the space station. So, so that so that is what this mission was about. That the U wasn't necessarily for unmanned per se, although that this particular Soyuz was going to the International Space Station as a uh, resupply mission. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. But we're the, but the International Space Station, as sadly they have run into this before or not run into it. I'm not really sure how to not word that in a bad way. That sounds weird for rocketry. Um, but they they've come across this issue before, and uh, and they're going to be okay. Everyone up there is safe and sound and happy and has plenty of non fresh apples to eat. <laughs> yes. Right. Unfortunately, I mean that's that's usually what it comes down to. That's for what the most it part. is. Um, so. Okay, so Jared. 
Yes. We have a return to flight, possibly? Yes, a possible kind of return to flight. Knock on yeah. wood? Knocking on as much wood as we can, <laughs> frankly. Um, but SpaceX looks like they're getting ready to return to flight on December 16th. And they're going to be doing the return to flight out of Vandenberg Air Force Base here in California. And like I said, launch is set for December 16th at 2036 Coordinated Universal Time. Now, this will be the return to flight for the Falcon 9 rocket after the pad explosion on September 1st during the, static, or during the uh, anticipated static fire um, for the launch of what was to be the a AMOS-6 satellite. Now, this is going to be a mighty big payload where they're carrying 10 satellites for the Iridium Corporation as a part of the Iridium Next program. Now, basically what this is, is these are 70 Iridium Next satellites that are going to form the newest, most advanced satellite phone and emergency location services constellation in low Earth orbit. Now, they have a contract that was signed in 2010 with Iridium. So this is one of the oldest SpaceX contracts hmm. um, that they have with a commercial supplier. And in addition to that, they will be launching 10 of these satellites at a time. So that means they're actually going to be carrying six, or excuse me, 8,600 kilograms to polar orbit 625 kilometers above the Earth. So this is a mighty big payload um, to be lofting, and they're going to be doing this as their return to flight. Now, there is an anticipated drone ship landing, um, oh. but uh, no word on whether that December 16th is going to hold or not. Uh, but we'll find out as soon as they start testing the pad in just a couple of days. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Hopefully that'll be just two weeks away. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even say the date, did I? Today's December 3rd. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, Mike, in the meantime, something has actually gotten up to the International Space Station. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. So, uh, a successful cargo mission Yay! was from Orbital Woo! ATK. And uh, what we're talking about is their Cygnus spacecraft, designated OA5, nicknamed SS Allen Poindexter. So, after 29 yes, days do. at the International Space Station, now we can go ahead and roll this uh, video of the separation there. Um, after 29 days, it separated on Monday, November 20th. 21st, and then actually began another week-long operation in orbit. And during that week-long operation, it uh, conducted the, the Sapphire 2 experiment. Oh, yeah, the fire the, one. And the, yeah, they're dropping the yeah. thing with the fire to see how it... Oh, I was really excited about this one. Man, we talked yeah. about this so flippin' long ago, I nearly forgot this is still a thing. Because the <laughs> Sapphire is a backronym, burned... right? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't write down what that what backronym stands for right I'll now, but uh, this talking. is actually a video of one of the samples. This is uh, number seven oh. out of nine samples that they took uh, uh, during during that mission there. That's so cool. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks really cool and really interesting how uh, the flame is is uh, kind of forming there. It's uh, all the experiments are really interesting though. I think my favorite is the one with the piece of paper that slowly was burning. But uh, Lisa Stojanowski has talked about this as well. And what you're seeing on screen there is a CubeSat called Lemur 2. And the Cygnus deployed four of these Lemur 2 CubeSats for Spire Global uh, after doing the Sapphire experiment. And these uh, CubeSats collect uh, maritime and weather data. Um, now, after it deployed those CubeSats, uh, it ended its mission on Sunday, November 27th, when it fired its engines to uh, slow down, lower its orbit, and then eventually re-enter the atmosphere. So, even though we've had this progress failure, all of the operations for the Cygnus vehicle were uh, completely successful. So, congratulations to Orbital ATK for that. And I do want to mention just real quick, with that the whole CubeSat thing that they, that they launched for Spire Global, mm -hmm. that was set up through NanoRacks, which has a CubeSat deployer on the the International Space Station. Nice. But when they did this, uh, the Cygnus vehicle actually raised its orbit to be in a higher orbit than the International Space Station, so that these CubeSats that they deployed would, would stay in orbit longer than the CubeSats that they deploy from the International Space Station. Those usually re-enter after just a couple of months. Huh. So uh, this, is a, this, was a, this was a first for, for them, and just another example of the whole public-private uh, partnerships that are able to allow things like this to happen. So. Very excited about that, and I want to see a lot more. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> I sadly can't, I still can't find the Sapphire Beckenham, but we will. We'll get on that a little bit later. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, Jared. Yes. This is, I don't even know how to describe this, because I, I, we watched part of the, the webcast as they were doing it, uh -huh. and I was like, this is like 
this is like Amazon for rockets. Like yes. I was so excited. <laughs> so you know, you know how you like you'll go to like a car company's website yes. and you can like build your own car. Yes. If you want to. Like right. you can custom one off your own car right. with it. Well, United Launch Alliance has announced a website called rocketbuilder.com, which you can actually go to and configure your own one of a kind Atlas V and figure out just how much it's actually going to cost it's you. It's almost like Kerbal meets Amazon. Yes, <laughs> and uh, here, here you can see I was actually putting in for a tomorrow sat to yes. see uh, what we may need uh, for 6,300 kilograms uh, to geosynchronous transfer orbit. Because I figure if we're going to have a satellite, it's going to be a big one. Because right. Ben likes big satellites. Right. He cannot lie. So uh, it's very important to make sure that they have that there. As he dances <laughs> to you can, that. Thank you, You can put inputs like <laughs> payload weight, fairing size, orbit, and boosters needed. And just to let you know, in case you wanted to actually purchase one through uh, this website, a Atlas V in the 401 configuration will start you off at about $109 million. <laughs> so <laughs> there you mini go. Mini Stoge in the chat room says, so how much does it cost to launch a mini Stoge into orbit? You know, for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we could figure that out. <laughs> Make that we could actually angle. calculate it. Well, it would, I would Let's imagine. We could <laughs> just find out. We could just put mini stoge on top mm -hmm. of an Atlas V in the 401 configuration. Uh -huh. So four meter payload fairing, no uh -huh. solid rocket boosters, single engine Centaur upper stage, uh -huh. um, and there you go. It would just cost us 109 million dollars. So and there'd be plenty of weight left yeah. over, you know, to give her protection and food and supplies. Exactly. And all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. We could put <laughs> we could put her in like a small little like let's talk, let's contact Copenhagen suborbitals and get their little capsule. Right. Um, and we could put Stoge yeah. in it because she would actually be able to walk around. What's the Patreon reward level for that? So, <laughs> yeah. What is the Patreon reward level for right, that? There, there's uh, a little, there's a yeah. level there. I guess yeah. I guess we could put a, a rocket builder. Patreon level, uh, right? Twenty-seven million dollars per episode. Per, ep sure. per episode, yeah, right. right, right, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. 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 That's new goal. Totally doable. New goal. Yeah, yes. yeah, totally. Oh. Can do that. <laughs> Patreon.com <laughs> slash tmro. Okay, uh, Mike, you've got some interesting updates coming out of XCore. What's going on over there? Yes, yes, this is some very good news. This so, uh, uh, for those of you who don't, you can sign up for email updates from uh, XCore Aerospace, and they released a uh, kind of November in review report. And with this, they've actually been actively at work on all of their different projects, and a lot of us were worried that you know, since they've kind of let go of some of their staff and been restructuring a bit, that you know there might be a chance that the Link space plane that they've been trying to build could be canceled. Right. That is not the case. So what they've been doing is they've been redesigning. Well, first of all, they did a lot of structural work and did a lot of the, the, the structural work for the, the main uh, vehicle itself. But what they haven't been doing a whole lot of work on is the control surfaces. So they halted all work on physical work on the Link spacecraft in order to look at the design for the different control surfaces. And uh, we have a couple images here from their uh, launch report where uh, they're looking at the, the flaps that will be on them. And what they, ha they have done is they have two different uh, types of flaps that are on the wings. And uh, the smaller ones are what they're calling trim flaps, which are also going to be a type of aero brake so that they can slow down when they're uh, coming back down on a descent and uh, uh, getting in, in a, a, t a type of glide where they can uh, control the vehicle and come back to a safe landing. Now, s until they design, uh, or rather finish the design on, on uh, th these control surfaces, they're going to halt all physical work on it. But in the meantime, they've also been working on a bunch of engines, one of which is uh, their, uh, the contract for United Launch Alliance, which is the big engine in the bottom of that graphic, um, or excuse me, actually the one right before the big engine there. That's a hydrogen engine for an upper stage. But the larger engine is a methane-based engine. And uh, they also have kerosene-based engines as well. And the larger engine is a possible application that they're trying to, to market through orbital ATK to be used on the space launch system, which could be used for like the exploration upper stage. So uh, they're doing a lot of work at XCore Aerospace, and I'm very happy to see that that is the case, and that they're, you know, even though it might seem that work has slowed down on the Link space plane, they are act actively working on the design for it and making sure that they don't have to redesign the entire vehicle to make sure that they can actually control the vehicle in the atmosphere. 
atmosphere. So I'm very happy about that. And uh, they, there was a whole bunch more news in, in, in their updates as well, talking about different uh, G-force training that they've been doing with jet aircraft and uh, their different uh, commercial astronauts that they're going to have, which I didn't even know they had commercial a astronauts until uh, this email update. So things are picking up quite well. And a lot of the different uh, legislation that they need to for some of their uh, th three different spaceports that they plan to use is coming along really well. And I'm really excited for the future. And uh, it looks like that x -Corps is still in the running to uh, compete with Virgin Galactic for suborbital space tourism. Very, very, very cool. Uh, speaking of Virgin, uh, really quickly, we don't, we sadly don't have any pictures or footage at the moment. Uh, but just so you know, earlier today, uh, the Virgin, uh, their Unity uh, was gliding for the very first time after being released from White Knight 2 or VMS Eve. And uh, they have some gorgeous pictures on their particular Twitter account, and I'm sure all over the internet right as we speak. Uh, so congratulations to them. It's really great to hear that x -Core is still going on. Yes. Uh, I don't know if they're going strong, per se, but at least they're going on. Somebody else in the chat room said, oh, wait, they're, they're still around? That's awesome. Uh, so ah. we're, it's, <laughs> it's really great to hear all this news of people uh, returning to flight and people continuing to flight and really sort of uh, pushing through any sort of hurdles that anybody's come across, including having to uh, maybe get rid of some people or just refocus on different things, as it were. And speaking of refocusing. Yes. <laughs> Jared. Yes. Let's move away from the Earth. Sure. Since all we've been talking about is stuff on the Earth. Boring. The, this is the boring. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? I sort of do. What about little, Mars? Yeah, I kind sure, of what a, here, sure, sure, what about Mars? Because we're all excited about Mars, right? Uh, yes, I'm Woo. also excited yeah. about Mars. Absolutely. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Tell me why I'm excited about Mars. This sounds like a Ben story, because all I read was something about Isa and gas, and then that sounded like a Ben fart yeah, joke. Yeah, it does sound like uh, trace gas. Yeah, all right. Especially considering that you can sample Ben sometimes in the studio. It, Not that we want to. Via trace But it just does end up happening. Via trace gas. Um, but all right, yes, so teach me more. The European Space <laughs> Agency's trace gas orbiter has been returning its first uh, set of data, basically calibration data, that is telling us that all the instruments on board are working correctly. Nice. Um, now, it has a five-year primary mission, which is to search for the origin of atmospheric methane on Mars. Of course, we know that there is methane in the atmosphere, and methane can come from two places. It mm -hmm. can come from a geological source mm -hmm. of active volcanism, or, which is, you know, that'd be a very exciting discovery right. to happen on Mars, or... I mean, yeah, because if that's where Spock went to die, then yes, yes. it would be very exciting. Or... Volcanism. Describe that one first before you move volcanism. on. Volcanism? Oh, uh, volcanoes. Got it. Okay. Basically. Sorry. Uh, yes, from active... Uh, or volcanism. Active geology not... involving... Volcanism. Yes, I got you there. Want to make sure? Very good. Good. So it almost it's went over logic. my head, but then, <laughs> then you did the hand, and I, I was like, oh, right. okay. Okay. So, or, from volcanoes, or... Volcanoes, or biological life. Like cows. Yes, like cow farts great. are a great source of methane. So there could be Earth. cow farts. Not so much cow farts, or but like bacteria volcanoes. farts. Okay. And this is uh, some imagery from the cameras that are on board of uh, Trace Gas Orbiter. And you'll notice that th it's four strips. Yeah. And those strips are there because the cameras, there's four separate cameras, aimed in four specific angles. Uh -huh. So what that does is that allows them to actually generate 3D maps from a single camera. Okay. So instead of having to have a stereoscopic system, so instead of two cameras very far apart from each other, right. they figured out how to angle these cameras so that you can actually generate 3D data that looks a little something like this. And uh, huh. it's it's unbelievable what they've been able to do with it. Um, now the imaging suite of course includes those cameras um, which allows the high resolution 3D mapping and in addition to that it also um, carries stereoscopic image or uh, stereoscopic sensors on board so basically looking at light breaking it down and seeing from light uh, what exactly is in the atmosphere and huh. that's you know that's such a cool thing that we can actually do that with uh, spectroscopy so very cool stuff. Now, Trace Gas Orbiter is going to use arrow braking over the next year to circularize its orbit to about 400 kilometers above the Martian surface. And there's an example of that 3D data that you can get just from the camera with a minimal amount of processing. Oh, I get it now. So, okay, good. That is unbelievably awesome that they are able to do that with one instrument. 
They don't have to use multiple instruments that like most really cool. spacecraft have to end up doing, or multiple passes from different orbits at different angles. Nope, they can just do it straight up, just going over once. So, That's very, really very awesome. awesome. Very convenient. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. That was smart. Yeah. You, you, the European uh -huh. Space Agency was very smart to figure out a system like Those that. Those guys so, are awesome. Yeah. Good thinking. Good th yeah. I'm so impressed right now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I think we all learned something today. Yes. Uh, okay. So that's that's about it for news that we have this week. Of course, we will be back next week with more news. But coming up just in a moment is Ben's going to be joining us, and we're going to be talking about <sighs> 2016 in review. We're only going to be talking about the space stuff, so it won't be a depressed episode, I promise. All right? So yes. <laughs> stay with us. We'll be talking about 2016 and 2017 coming up. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And while Ben isn't behind the camera now, he's just off to my left, still being distracting. So that's fantastic. It's the only mode I know. It's we're, the only mode I know. Apparently. Oh, goodness. <laughs> anyway, we're going to go ahead and uh, thank our Patreon premiere members one more time. Thank you. One more time. One more time. Yeah, apparently, because I'm trying to like say things and read things and do things all at the same time. Tim, and it's not working very Same well. Uh, <laughs> and then we're also going to thank our Patreon producers. These are the people who have given us $5 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. And these people also get the free worldwide shipping from our swag store, which is really kind of fun. Uh, yeah, ben and I totally did not grab mugs, but you can grab the, get these really cool mugs, or there's some pins, or there's some... That is not a good advertisement. I don't know why you did that. Why'd you uh, do that? Or you could grab some pens. I didn't, I didn't some grab a mug. It's pens. still in the little, it's right. still in the little well, thing. Go grab a mug. We're still on the slate. They can't see us. It's totally fine. We <laughs> <laughs> should be on the slate for the next like 10 minutes. I oh, mean, by the way, we just or, said or, it on air. Or know? until she says patreon.com slash tomorrow. Uh, or as my producer is reminding me to say that you too can also have your name in this wonderful show. I am stretching ever so slightly, not a big deal, because by going to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O-K. Well, that's about as close as I can get. That's it. Then we switch cameras at that time and I always forget that part too. Not a problem. Don't mind that piece. This is exactly why you join us live. Because <laughs> you never know what's going to be edited out of the show. <laughs> oh, we're not editing that out of the show. I know, but uh, you before don't know what else show, has was, been was, edited out of the so show. So Mike, Mike was dancing before the show. He's doing a little dance like this, and I was sitting there going, <laughs> like as she's trying to do her introduction. It was, uh, it was fun. So distracting is what it, it was. was. Fun. It, was it was so fun. distracting. Okay, so 2016 has been the year of I don't even know what. <laughs> What the actual F, it's I been think, a is year what of most a, things have. It's been a year of a lot of launches. There have been a lot of launches. So that's the, the we're going to focus on the happy things. <laughs> we're going to focus. Well, hang on. Space Mike, you created a document, a, a Google Docs document yes. that kind of outlined some of these launches. You want to go over some of what you, uh, what you wrote? There's so much. There's so much that happened in 2016. There's so, so much. And if I can hear, the Mike, year. there we go. Oh, there we go. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so um, I actually started this list at the beginning of the year just to kind of keep track uh, for my own fun of all the different launches this year and then divide them up by country and kind of have a final tally to know, uh, you know who has launched the most into space this year. And uh, it's been interesting over the past couple of years, you know, reading different years in review articles and saying that, you know, the Russians had the most uh, space launches this year or the Chinese had the most space launches this year. And uh, so I wanted to kind of keep track and, and uh, know how many, uh, how many launches that everyone was doing. 
And uh, the final tally so far this year, now there's still 13 launches that are scheduled for the month of December. And if Whoa. all of those go off, yeah, yeah, and that's just for the month of December. And if all of those go off successfully, then December will be the most launches in one month for the year of 2016. But so far this year, what we have is 72 orbital space launches, successful orbital space launches. I'm not counting the uh, suborbital flights. And uh, to kind of divide this up by country, uh, China and Russia both tied for 18 successful orbital launches this year. The United States is leading with 19 successful launches this year. And then I also want to mention that India has had six successful launches. The European Space Agency has had seven successful launches. North Korea and Israel are tied with one successful launch this year. And then Japan has two successful launches with hopefully a third in, in uh, about a week with uh, their HTV cargo vessels. So I'm really impressed with the amount of launches that have happened this year. One launch that I was really looking forward to, but hasn't happened and probably won't happen until April was a launch from Iran to have their uh, much larger Simorg rocket, which would be able to deliver twice as much of uh, the payload as they previously could and would be powerful enough to send up their own one-person Mercury-class uh, capsule into space. So that was something I was really looking forward to, but didn't quite uh, happen this year because of problems with their upper stages. But in any case, I'm really impressed at the uh, successful launches this year and how the United States, for, you know, finally over you know the past five years has lost to either China or Russia for most amount of orbital launches in a year. So, so far, the United States is holding the record for uh, most amount of launches. And with that, I'm, I'm including not only the NASA launches, but all the commercial launches as well that are from United States companies from the launching from the United States. So... Very interesting. Now, something else that I, I wanted to kind of ask the, uh, the the chat room and, and uh, the audience is the whole relationship between the Russian Space Agency and the European Space Agency, or more specifically, Ariane Space, licensing the Soyuz rocket to launch from French Guiana. Now, I count those Soyuz launches as a successful launch for Russia because they still built and manufactured the rocket and still have teams there at Fre French Guiana to make sure that all the procedures and operations for launching the rocket go successfully. Mm. And uh, with that, there's a lot of different payloads that were launched on other Russian rockets that were launched from Baikonur or uh, Plisek, um, but that were European payloads. So I was just focusing just on the rockets themselves, not necessarily payloads. So I think you have my to. question for you guys, yeah. yeah but no, I my think question you have to. You but this is where that's tricky, though, because yeah, Russia made the rocket, but Russia didn't actually fly the rocket, right? It was Ariane Space that flew the rocket. So our, that's right. So yeah, Russia made the rocket. Should so we that, count that for a European launch, or should we count was, that as it, a Russian? It, it was essentially right because uh, that's a clever, interesting nuance there, right? So ignoring payload completely, uh, once they built the rocket, they handed it over to Ariane Space. Not quite that simple, and they said, "Here, go fly this from Ariane Space's own launch complex, Ooh. mind you, not even from a Russian complex." So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it flew out of French Guiana. So. Okay, then yeah, then and whoever, there was, I was, whoever, where, wherever it flew, right, should, that's flew, a really, wherever it, <laughs> wherever it was, whoever controlled it. This is a really, con well, this is where it gets tricky too, because Russia was there Ooh. helping control it. What, uh, mm -hmm. oh, that's sorry, our I'm Green Jim, real quick. Yeah, there Green was, Jim says, it, so when yeah. Space Launch System launches, will it be a U.S. launch, even though it will have an uh, ESA, European Space Agency supplied service module? Yes, it will still be a U.S. launch. What I'm saying is, like the people, yes. yeah, so shuttle. Who made shuttle? NASA didn't make shuttle. Who built the? Yeah. Who built shuttle? We count shuttle? that as Boeing Rockwell. launches. Or right. We NASA don't count launches. exactly. We don't count that yeah. as a Boeing launch. We count that as a NASA yeah. launch because NASA controlled the shuttle. Sure. So yes. all right. So then that would be. The, I think that's fair. Whoever whoever was the primary controller of the launch vehicle is probably it was their launch, right? I mean, it was yeah. their pad, their infrastructure, because a launch is so much more than just a rocket, right? It's all the ground systems, it's all the people, it's all the infrastructure, it's all, the, all that fun jazz, branding. right? I think it's who yeah. controls the vehicle. The vehicle controls the vehicle. No, so. you, you understand what I'm saying. Don't get technical. Uh, with me well, no, I mean, but, but <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, you have to get technical on this stuff. You really look at, like, I. No, I mean, it's not, I guess it's, what I'm saying is it's nuanced. It's not black and white, all right? So it's, it's who controlled the vehicle? So, all right, who did control the vehicle? If, if we're saying the vehicle didn't control the vehicle, they had Russian engineers there. The Russian engineers were also controlling the vehicle. So 
maybe it was Russia, even though it was from an ESA launch facility, but then it was a Russian controlling the vehicle. So is it now a Russia launch? This is where this gets nuanced and confusing. Yeah. And so let's say for a moment that we do count those <laughs> Soyuz launches from French Guiana towards uh, Arion Space, or rather the European Space Agency. If my count is right, then there were four Soyuz launches from French Guiana this year, and I would take away four launches from Russia and give those to the European Space Agency, which would mean that they have a, the European Space Agency had 11 successful launches, and Russia only had 14 successful launches. So that's where I'm you know, up in the air. I, I, don't, I, I don't think this is easily points. answered. I, I'm curious, you asked as well. I'm curious to know what the chat room thinks. Like, chat room, uh, comments, uh, how do we count some of these launches where the vehicle's built by one country and then flown by another company, but country, but with support from the first country flying potentially a payload from a completely third different country and possibly a fourth different location of a country for the actual launch itself, <laughs> right? So w yeah. which country, who, who uh, that's, that's all sorts of messed up. Thank or you, exactly. That's, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Mighty Jin says, who's on the launch certificate? Because if it hits... If it hits someone or something, then they're the ones that are paying the bill. Actually, who is on the launch? Yeah, for, uh, Stoge, Stoge kind of said <clears> the same <throat> thing, which is that according to space law and insurance things, the state responsible for the launch is the one where the launch has occurred. So it's physical location of the launch itself then? Must be. Right, so it doesn't matter who controls the launch, it's the actual literal location of the launch pad mm -hmm. is the country that is responsible for the launch. So the controller is irrelevant, location is what's relevant. According to space law, yes. Okay, so interesting. What do you guys think? In that think? case, then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, what do you guys think? What, what, who, who is, uh, who's responsible? Who, who should we tally this in under? All right, let's, let's uh, move. Uh, one other interesting uh, point is uh, at current rate, there are 72 launches, which means that we averaged one launch every five days or so. I, I'm rounding at that point. So every week, more than once per week, we had a launch. Yes. Uh, go yes. into space. And we still have, you know, 13, 13 more, more scheduled right. yeah. to go. Yeah, because the, I mean, even so. the lowest launch, the, there are two months there were only four launches in, but that's mm -hmm. still one a week. Right. If On average. Yes. That, that, I just think it's all sorts of incredible that, he, I mean, we, we look at space and sometimes, you know, it, it gets interwound with like... Uh, um, uh, politics and whatnot, and sometimes you get depressed of like where you want the space program to be. But when you look at what humanity as a whole is doing and launching something to space every five days, that's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. We put something in space every five days throughout the last year on average. That's a cadence that that probably was matched at the beginning of the space race. Well, so yeah. then looking forward, is that same? Are we going to have that level of cadence? Wait, 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 wait. So at the beginning of the space race, you think we launched that? Because we tried we to were, launch that often. We but were launching a lot during the space well, race. Well, we were failing a lot, too. You, right? That's why, no, that's why we were space launching Mike, a lot. You only included successful launches, right? Right. Yeah, by we, you're talking to the Russians and the Americans, right? Sure, yes. Yes. Okay. I don't think... I mean, I'd have to look at the numbers. I'd have to collect something, because, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how... I honestly don't know what the frequency was of successful launches uh, at the beginning of the space race. And I mean, <laughs> the first uh, several uh, orbital launch attempts from America, like what, the first like seven were uh, complete failures uh, with the Vanguard rockets? So, yeah, Vanguard uh, was a f spectacular failing, failing, not so much at <laughs> delivering payloads. Yeah, actually, so, as Dada yeah. says, uh, Space Night needs to dig deeper and gather more data. Uh, actually, it seems like we are nerding out over this data something hardcore. So if you don't mind, Space Mike, <laughs> uh, other questions that are coming up of um, uh, Levi asks, uh, how does this year's expected 85 launches compare to last year's? Uh, so how did we do? And actually, be kind of curious to know how we did trending over time over like the na last few decades. Like, how did we do from the beginning of, the, of launches? We'll say reasonable beginning of launches because you could all go all the way back to like ancient China and these little little things. But oh, like Machua. Like yeah, yeah let, let's yeah. talk. Let's talk like Soyuz forward, right? So we, <laughs> we can draw a line there. So Soyuz forward. Yeah. Uh, Why can't know, we do the rocket cart? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> if we cho if we chose the rocket cart, it'd be a thousand at a time. Uh, I'll classify that under suborbital launches. Yeah, we could do, it could work. <laughs> so going back, by the way, based on the, the, the law, um, those Soyuz rockets launching from French Guiana, since that is a French territory, means those launches go to France. Really? Yeah. Yes. And that's, this is where those nuances that's get true. interesting, right? Oh my so gosh. So technically speaking, 
Technically speaking, you need to add France into this list if we're going to count that not as Russia and we're going to look at space law. But also... Like, if we're looking at, like, what, what yeah. Minnie Stoge said, like, that certificate, I think that goes to France then, right? We'd almost have to argue like what the actual like legal. We are setup lingering on this Arion way more than I thought. Okay, yeah. we're thinking too because hard about we this. Are. Arion space, we are. Arion space has investors all over the European Union. So are they really a French company still, or are they this, a European Union company? Oh man, this gets okay. This is getting way. You know, <laughs> all right, all right, we're going to stop it. So leave your comments. Curious to know what you think, or if you have a real answer, like if you actually know what's going on. Because uh, <laughs> we clearly we're like I don't know I don't know I don't know I don't know, yeah, I don't know what though. category what I, to put him in. What I want to know is what I want to ask uh, the community is what were some of your favorite launches this year? And I think we should kind of go around the table and talk about what our highlights were for this year. Uh, of, uh, I'm not even favorite. sure it should be launches. I, I think your favorite moments in space, right? Your favorite moments of 2016. Uh, Jared, uh, I'll put you in, into the hot seat and start with you. You're welcome. Sure, go for You're it. You're welcome. Um, Donna, I'm going to go to you too, just so you know. Oh so. my gosh, what was my favorite? I'm, you know, I can you come back to me because I got to think. I got to think through both crude <laughs> space, uh, human space flight, and um, and uh, uh, robotic space flight. So, mm. can you come back to me in a second? Yeah, so, you, get, you only get one moment. Okay, uh, Carrie Ann, do you have a favorite moment of 2016? Uh, a favorite, just a favorite space moment, spacey well, related moment. Obviously, I, why wouldn't I have one? What's your favorite spacey related moment of 2016? Uh, so this one's a little bit more on the personal side. That's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, the uh, there was a SpaceX January launch that was coming out of California, mm -hmm. and uh, my birthday's always in January because that's when I was born. I guess that was a silly statement, but uh, <laughs> I, sometimes that's March. <laughs> I usually celebrate it right around that time. Um, and uh, for the for the very first time, Ben and I uh, had decided to bring with us Cat, Kitty, and, and Dada to uh, Disney World because we almost always go. And uh, it was all planned out. Mm -hmm. It was planned to a T, and it was every gonna, day. Every day, every hour, just not about quite, every hour. Not quite that bad, but yes, there not, were there not were as much slots, as Kitty would have liked. Slots, but yes, yes. Uh, yep. And <laughs> uh, there was a launch that managed to to slide. That that particular launch slid <laughs> into that vacation, and so I looked at fog. Ben and I said, "Well, I I mean, if it was just me, I might stay." I, I might actually even go to Vandenberg mm -hmm. because we, we lived only Good. a couple hours south of Vandenberg. Good thing you didn't. Um, I said, but yes. I, I have to I have to go with them. I, I can't I can't deprive them of their vacation. That would just be silly. Yep. Uh, and so the three of us went uh, and and to Walt Disney World. Not to to went to, yep. to Walt Disney World. And uh, that particular day, as per schedule, we were supposed to be at Epcot. And we were. And uh, we actually delayed our lunch a little bit so we could sit outside of where we were supposed to go to lunch, which just happened to be underneath one of the monorails, uh, uh -huh. and watch the launch on our on our cell phones all together, kind of all so huddled around awesome. this teeny tiny <laughs> little, and you couldn't see Jack Squat. Neither could we at Vandenberg. <laughs> you <laughs> could see exactly what they could see, yeah. Actually, exactly. you probably had a better view than what they but, had. But uh, yeah, I, so I mean, while it was ultimately was kind of a, a it was very bittersweet because it was an awesome moment for the three of us to sort of be there all together, kind of sharing this moment in a, in a really weird kind of public space, trying to explain to people while we're screaming at our phones, uh, you know, in light rain, if I remember correctly. Uh, <laughs> but at this and I and missing you because yeah. it was right around my birthday. So it was like a weird like bittersweet sort of thing but it was it was really awesome I, I do remember that so we finished up we finished the launch it was all successful uh, you couldn't see any of it because it was foggy that day uh, so all right do that and like as soon as the mission ends I'm already like picking up the phone to schedule my flight down to Florida I'm like what is the fastest you can get me there get me there now and I did I jumped on a plane uh, I drew from there straight to LAX I had my luggage already packed uh, flew down and I got in at like what two in the morning or something some, like that. Some I just know that you like landed way. and came straight to the park to meet us there. Uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah it was. I was one unit of exhausted, uh, but yeah, I made it that made it down there. And then, did I miss your birthday or did I? No, I made your birthday, but I missed the beginning part of the trip. Yeah, there you yeah. go. But mm -hmm. you made the birthday. Made the birthday. Made the yeah. Birthday. So I mean, yeah. like, it's kind of a weird. 
it's a weird favorite moment because it's not even necessarily a favorite moment, but it definitely sticks out so distinctly in my mind. Sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. It was a very bittersweet Kitty, day. Kitty says it was a bittersweet day. Kitty says day. live, yeah. Yeah, uh, totally. If, if, if I ahead. may, um, I think uh, some of my favorite moments from this year was uh, back in April. Uh, I believe it was the CRS-8 mission that SpaceX launched where they successfully landed on the drone ship for the first time. That mm-hmm. was huge. I was with my father and my grandfather showing them this, and I was just like, they're going to try to land on, on the ship, and they're just like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then when it happened, all three of us, you know, got out of our chairs, and we were just like, yes, and just freaking Go! out. They did it, yeah. they did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a huge deal. I mean, we'd already had the successful uh, landing um, uh, in December of 2015, but to land on the drone ship that just blew my mind and you know leading up to that particular launch too like Elon and and other SpaceX officials are just like you know we're it probably won't work this time either but you know we're gonna keep trying until we eventually get it you know it seemed like it was gonna be another close call that you know and it was successful it was such a surprise and just the fact that I was sharing that with uh, with my father and grandfather made that especially a special moment to me um, also, the the uh, ITS announcement for the uh, interplanetary transport system. It really needs a new and name. And getting to come to the <laughs> studio and to see everyone, you know, in yeah, person. That was we just awesome. had such such an amazing time. That was that was incredible. That was that was definitely my one of my highest uh, space moments of this year. And going to get to tour the SpaceX uh, headquarters as well. That just was a dream come true. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so we don't have a camera in the control room yet, but I'm going to toss it to Dutta. Because he can talk, yeah, he, now he's glaring at me. Uh, what was your favorite moment of 2016? And we'll all sit here and stare awkwardly at the camera as you answer. Well, I was going to say drone ship landing. Thanks, Mike. You can have the same favorite moment. You weren't with Mike, it's okay. No, that, that, that really was an incredible moment. And I uh, was watching online, at, at, I think it was at work, and tried to get a couple people, a couple other people involved in watching it. And I, I had the restrain myself from standing up in my cubicle and shouting <laughs> yeah! I was, it, it was it was an absolutely incredible moment to, to finally see the realization of all the hard work all of the explosions all the fire all the bent metal and repaired you know drone ships and I mean it, that that one moment crystallized everything that SpaceX had been trying to do for years to be able to re- reuse a rocket. Okay, now we got one back. We got one back. Awesome. And I, I'm still waiting for that next step for them to, to be able to, to re- actually refly a rocket, but that was that was an incredible moment. All right, Jared, you ready? Yeah, I've got two All as right. well. You're al- like I'll allow it. I'll allow it. So, um, so one of mine was the end of the Rosetta mission. So just because that had been uh, 12 years in the making and just the, the unbelievable results and data that came from the Rosetta mission just blew everyone away. Um, it was the little probe that could and... Those cute it, little animations it, that went with it. Yeah, it just yeah. really hit you so hard. Um, the, the fact that 12 years of work finally came to a conclusion and uh, 12 very hard years and very well-earned data um, with that. Um, but for me, the biggest one this year uh, definitely had to be the announcement that we had detected gravitational waves. Hmm. So that's the big one for me, simply because, you know, 100 years ago, um, Einstein, with the theories of relativity, came up with the mathematics that basically said that we, uh, or basically said gravitational waves are a thing. Um, but even Einstein himself said you know, we're never going to be able to detect them because they're much too small for us to even contemplate detecting. And then here we are, a hundred years, the centennial celebration of the, of the publishing of the paper that allowed us to describe gravitational waves, we find them. It's just a hundred years of looking and hunting and look, trying to find the heartbeat of the universe itself. And we've, we did it. And we found it. And we found two of them. Not just one, two. We got two. And then we get to uh, upgrade the um, laser interferometry gravitational wave observatory LIGO again. And now it's running again. And we'll have to see what amazing results it's going to give us. 
I like a comment well. from Destructor 1701. I'm loving the diversity of opinion on the most awesome thing this year. You're all right in how fantastic a year this has been in space stuff, and it really has. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what at, about you, Ben? What were some of your favorite I was going to say, adding mine, I actually have, I think, three distinct moments, and one of them was very recently. Um, I'm trying to remember if the first one actually was this year or if it was last year, but uh, New Horizons was this year, right? Last year. It was last year. Okay, so... It's still... But all the data is still coming back, so. Right. So, uh, some of those pictures, I think, came in this year, which is why I'm thinking it was this year. Yes. Uh, the imagery from Pluto and... See, igno blah, blah, blah planet. Uh, but the imagery coming back and, like, just the awesomeness that is Pluto and how unique and incredible of a celestial object it is... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Sharon, Sharon, how do you, Sharon, Sharon? Karen, Charin? Ho however, uh, like the two of, like that one is almost like part of it got ripped away. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the imagery from those two is yeah. mind numbingly awesome. The geological diversity of Pluto, is there is no other place in our solar system that has that kind of geological diversity. It's incredible. Yeah. I'm loving the imagery that came back. And, uh, and, and about the imagery, up until New Horizons was approaching, it was a number of, a very small number of pixels. Yeah. Yes. That's all we knew about. That was yeah. it. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm also excited in 2017, looking forward to getting our camera in the control room so we can actually see Dada. That's going to be fantastic. Yes, we can finally <laughs> hear him. We can finally hear him, but soon we'll be able to see him too. Uh, so that was that was number one. Even though that was a, you're right, the flyby happened last year, and then one could argue, well, it happened. I mean, that's been a decades-long mission. Yes. Right, because that's another that's one of That's like those. Rosetta. It took so long to actually make it happen. The difference, though, is Rosetta kind of went and stayed there. Yes. Right? Whereas New Horizons was going so fast it had to go, oh, okay, goodbye. Uh, but they're going to be retasking yeah. <laughs> New Horizons. It lives on, right? They're yes. going to be retasking it with new innovative missions of things that it can sort of hopefully get to. So yeah. that will be really cool. Yeah, too. they already did the engine burn for it to fly by a Kuiper Belt object on January 1st, 2019. It's going to be awesome! Be I know. Great. I'm super excited for that. All right. Uh, <laughs> the second thing that I was really excited about um, uh, that I just think is one of those, it's me looking forward kind of thing, was the, uh, the It's announcement. It really, really needs a new name. Um, seeing, <laughs> seeing someone lay, okay, so I have to do the disclaimer. Carrie Ann and I work at SpaceX. The views and opinions on the show are not that of SpaceX. They are our own opinions, have nothing to do with SpaceX whatsoever. Uh, but watching the future unfold like that, watching someone go, this is my vision for how humans make it to Mars. And by the way, we're building it. Right, I, I was surprised that the room was as quiet as it was when they're like, here's the engine firing and here's a giant part of the tank that we've built, the hard part. Uh, that was incredible. That was a really awesome moment, uh, at least I thought in space of like, we're doing this guys, this is happening. This is, we're going forward with this. Yes. And the third most incredible moment happened very recently. And um, this was, I got a personal tour of the Griffith Observatory. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, I've always kind of, no, yeah, he's going to be embarrassed. Uh, I, I was kind of was moderately interested in uh, um, uh, astronomy. astronomy. I almost said astrology. Uh, astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, some of the things that solidified this for me were, uh, first off, your tour, your passion was mind-numbingly, mind-blowingly awesome. <laughs> well, it let me be clear. Incredible. Ben and I, when we first moved to California, we we went to Griffith. Mm -hmm. It was one of the very few... Ben's father actually grew up in Southern California, mm -hmm. and, and these are kind of his old stomping grounds. And uh, Ben and I don't get out of the house much. You might be able to tell that by how lovingly tan we are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that was just your native Minnesota coming out. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but Ben's father has had said a number of times, like, have you gone up to Griffith? Have you gone up to Griffith? Mm -hmm. And we were like, well, whatever, we'll get, we'll there. Get, we'll there, get we'll there, there, we'll get there, we'll get there. And we did once, yeah, and, and I don't even remember why we decided to do it, because we're like, we live in Anaheim, it's way over <laughs> on the other side of town. It is, it's we an went, hour, hour and a half It was crowded, away. I think it was a hot day, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We walked in, we were like, this is busy as snot. Yep, that's the sun, I know what that does. Yep, that's the moon, I know what that does. Yep, that's a thing that I can't look at, because, you know, it's the sun, or it's not the night, or I don't know what's going on anymore. Went outside, said, yep, that's smog, I know that what that does, and we left. Yep. We were maybe there a half an hour. No, I think it was a little longer than that, but it wasn't very long. It was not very long, and most of that time was 
parking, walking up the freaking hill, and oh then walking God. back down the yes. hill and finding our freaking car. In, a parking in Griffith is awful. But parking, that, there's just no way to get around it. That so. there, there is no way to get around yeah, it. Yeah, they but, can build a parking structure. No, but it doesn't matter. But how the, many dollars are you going to give us to do that? The point. Oh, I'll give you a lot of dollars to do that because that is miserable. For that. <laughs> give you a lot of dollars for that. Um, any one of those stupid things of like the pennies that go down the hole. Be like, look, kids, here's gravity. Good. All those pennies are going to make a parking structure. That would be nice. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, we I sort of felt like we, I didn't feel like we did it, but I kind of was like, yep, been there. Neat. Yep. Anyway. And uh, my parents were coming out for Thanksgiving. And as my dad aptly pointed out, eight days is a little too much. And we needed mm -hmm. uh, something to do with them. And they had, they had never been to Griffith. We never brought them to Griffith. And uh, you kindly made the offer to say, hey, well, I'm going to be here on a certain day. And my shift ends at a certain time. But we're open for a few hours after that. If you want to come by right around that time, I'm doing this thing. I can you know, punch out from work. And I can give you a tour. And yeah. I was like, great. Somebody else for my parents to talk to. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. If they're they were watching, wonderful people. I'm kidding. And if, if my in-laws are kidding or are, are watching, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm joking. I'm being really harsh on my parents right now. I feel a little bit oh my bad. Gosh, <laughs> it is good comic relief, so. <laughs> it is. It is. I do love my parents and they love me. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> but no, but it... it it was better than Ben and I, who, like I said, went there and said, yep, that's the sun, yep, that's the moon, yep, that's smog, and let's get out of here. It was better than any sort of <laughs> tour that we could have given. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, so it, there. It was. It was absolutely incredible. There was a moment uh, almost 10 years ago now where um, I was doing research on the space shuttle, and my passion for space was rekindled. And um, that's what started this show. I have not had that same moment until I did that tour with you. And there was a passion for um, space, a different type of passion that was um, rekindled. I mean, I, I had a vague interest in the stars as a child, but n not to that level. And it was that same like, oh my God, this is awesome. The whole like uh, one inch away, one inch of oh, finger. Oh, our big picture. The big yeah. picture was absolutely awesome. Amazing. The symbolism of the planets was incredible. Uh, I thought that was really cool. Uh, and then seeing how a lot of this, uh, it, one thing you didn't mention, but I was making the ties to, is how all of this ties and pulls into society and culture one way or another. Yeah. Even the symbols for men and women are actually planetary symbols, which I had never connected those dots before. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was absolutely blown away, and I'm going to hereby volunteer your time on the show. Uh, if you're ever in town and he happens to be working, yes. see if you can get a tour from Jared. It is the most incredible thing I have done. <laughs> Dare I say all year, I don't it know about was, that, but... I do, I do, <laughs> it was awesome. And I was talking about it for a very long time in the car. I continue to say amazing things about it. I'm even wearing a shirt from Griffith Observatory I today. I too, actually. She is as well. It was Great. That was one of my top moments of 2016 in space. Well, I'm glad I was able to do that for you. You guys. were absolutely able That's to do awesome. that for it was, you. It was so much fun. Uh, the only thing is that I wish that the telescope had been open for you guys to look through it. It was so. stupidly but windy that night. It, yeah. That's okay. I'm not sure that that how much that actually would have added to the experience. It was. Um, well, the other thing is that just it was like that we dot said, connecting moments and like those. We yeah. said the same yeah. thing for when we brought Cat and Dada to to Disney World. Is that you want to like sort of leave them wanting a little something? Right? Like, sure. You don't just show everybody everything the very first time, right? right. So, uh, you know, we live here. We can go back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, It's totally fine. It's only two and a half hours away. Yeah, I think car. you guys are coming back. Yeah, we're going back. So. Uh, we're bringing the Duddas, I think, on December 31st because we did. You do a you do a presentation. Yes. Uh, that and we, we missed, missed it sadly. because we were in the car. Freaking LA traffic forever, forever. <laughs> and we missed it by five minutes. The Welcome doors. to my commute <laughs> to work. But it was also like Thanksgiving, like. <laughs> Yeah. Commute time. It, it yeah. sincerely took us nearly three hours to get from Anaheim to Griffith. It was ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Destructor 1701, uh, I would, uh, oh, oh, visiting F F9021 in front of space. So here's the thing. I would actually flip those. So visiting Falcon 921, the landed vehicle, is awesome and very cool, uh, but it's kind of on a busy street and you're not, there's not like a lot there, right? It's that and you can't do anything. You, there's also no parking there either. There is no parking there either. Whereas at Griffith, <laughs> the, Griffith, the experience is a little different. It's the same, like it, you can't figure out how to get there slash park. 
So that it's, all it's is a the fully, same. It's a full LA experience. It's a full LA experience. Are way yeah. too many people. You can't park, and everyone's angry at everyone else. But there's a lot more to do. Uh, if <laughs> if you're ever in the Los Angeles area, I cannot recommend enough going to Griffith. The hard part is when we went the first time. There there are no tour guides. No. Right. You just have to kind of find someone at Griffith that can talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. And if you can't find anyone, you're completely on your own. And that uh-huh. experience isn't as good. That Yeah, that's a little yeah. frustrating. It kind of, it is an as-you-go um, kind of place in terms of, of how you can experience it. Um, but that's where people like me come in, which is to facilitate the understanding. I think if you people, walk in so. and you want to talk to somebody, this is going to sound really crazy, but sincerely, I think you should walk in and be like, Hi, I'd like to talk to somebody who works here, please. <laughs> somebody who works here. Yeah, Anybody can, work here? That somebody works. works here. Because then somebody will be like, shut that crazy woman up. And they will send somebody <laughs> to you. By the way, they'll say, shut that crazy woman they up, even if will. Jared is doing it, or if I'm doing it. <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> But that's the thing. Like, I, But Ben's totally right. Uh, in And uh, to, uh, to be fair, uh, Jared did give us an amazing tour, but you also introduced us to people where they have made, they're a little bit stronger in some areas than you are yes. on Griffith property Absolutely. as well. So yeah. we talked about meteorites nearly ad nauseum. I got to the point where my mom tapped out before I did, but I, I did get to the point where I was like, <laughs> I cannot input any more information. I feel like I, I yeah, am full and I, I just- We were I'm watching real time cosmic radiation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was cool. Okay. Yeah. I, I, anyhow, anyhow. Awesome. That that was one of my awesome moments. If you're ever in Los Angeles, absolutely recommend it, uh, going up to Griffith. Yeah. If you can find someone like Jared to walk you around a little bit, uh, they like if you can find the person, they're more than happy to do it. That's why they're there. Or just get in touch with me. Sure. And yeah. I will totally give you. A How do they get in touch with you? So uh, Jared at tomorrow.tv. There you go. So. All right. So there's that. Um, what are you looking forward to, really quickly, because the show's running long now. Really long now. Uh, what are you looking forward yeah, to sorry. in 2017? Oh no, no. Uh, you know, uh, that's the neat thing about having an internet show. We can go longer. We can go short. But we don't. We don't want to drag on if we're not mm. going to. So uh, uh, what are you looking for? I. Oh, no. I know we have to take a break, and then we're going to come back in comments. Right. Our oh, dir- and continue? Our director's yelling at us. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, sure. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about 2017. Actually, I'm going to roll 2017 and com- a couple comments together. All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back. More launches. More launches. Launches. And I get to open the third segment. Yay! That's something I was totally prepared for. In any case, <laughs> oh, yep, this is what happens. We take one week off and then Carrie Ann doesn't know what's going on anymore. So let's get to our tomorrow <laughs> premiere members. These are the people who I be- keep thinking throughout the entire show uh, as because they've been giving us the most money and so their name keeps popping up over and over and over again. The, then we also have our producers. These people have giving us $5 or more. They get the free worldwide shipping from our swag store. And uh, yeah, that's all. And their names keep popping up over and over in the show. But do not fret. We also have our Patreon Plus members. These people have given us $2.50 or more, and they get early access to After Dark, which is thing that comes up after the show, which is really cool. Look at all of you people. So many names. Look at Man. all of you people. It's Yeah, it's really impressive. <laughs> we I, love you all. We do. I I love that you love us. That's just really great. But there's even more than Me that. Too. These are our Patreon patrons. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Apparently. This is magical. <laughs> I hate you all, except for you people, <laughs> except for you. You're the only people I love. Thank you so much. Here's your name in the show. Please find it, circle it on your screen, and then see if it moves around next week. Uh, these are the people who get the name of the show. <laughs> 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 they, can... <laughs> they also get access to Google Hangouts. What? Any 
in case if you want to circle your name on the show, <laughs> you should go over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. <laughs> That's a big deal, patrons. You are the only one that Carrie Ann loves. The only That's one. Right. That's a big deal. <laughs> Oh, I'm, getting, I'm getting lightheaded. I got the right camera so. this time, so you guys all can shove it. In any case, <laughs> like I said before, that's why you watch live. This Good is times. all sorts of awesome, and you, you've Take got a, a standing, standing ovation from Dutta, and uh, I believe you need to host all of the shows from now on, because that was epic. <laughs> Uh, who yeah. wants to start off with their favorite? What you're? What are you looking forward to most in 2017? I'll start. Oh off. my God! You're okay. So. Yeah, you're going. Because I've got two things. I've got two things. Perfect. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. You got, okay. Wait, I can so. like tell you're asking permission. I did like three for 2016 and spent like half an hour on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we got two true. things coming okay. up. Um, and this, this first one will probably be for pretty much a majority of you, but uh, hopefully Falcon Heavy flying. Oh my God! That's gonna be <laughs> yep. so awesome. Just do it already. And, <laughs> and also just. Do it. And also, um, 27 engines firing concurrently. 27 engines. Oh, that's I want to hear what that sounds this is like. A, this is how you can tell that I am still not a complete 100% space geek. Because you're like super excited about all the power, and all I can think is all those people's windows. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to have to buy windows. And that's a very scary thought to me. Um, and then finally, finally, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be basically assembled and then packed up and sent down to French Guiana for launch this year uh, in 2017. The telescope that ate the budget is finally going to get ready to fly, and we can finally open up the budget to. Wait, wait, to be fair, it that. ate the budget, and then it ate it some more, yes. and then it ate some future budget, and then it ate some more of that, and yeah. then it kept eating that, yeah. and yeah. then it ate itself. And then it ate itself. Yes. So oh, it almost yeah. did. Oh. It almost ate itself. Yes. Yeah. It very much almost did. Question. Uh, based on space law, does that mean we can blame James Telescope's problems on the French? I think maybe, sure. yes. Sure. <laughs> I think possibly. Sounds no. good to me. No? Okay. Yep, James Webb. Uh, yeah, all right, Space James Mike. <laughs> space Mike, for you. <sighs> Favorite upcoming um, 2017 moment? Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be a particular moment, but I'm really looking forward to the commercial crew de um, development over 2017. Mm. Hopefully, SpaceX will be able to have uh, their first test flight of the, the, the tr Crew Dragon vehicle, although it will be unmanned on, on that first test flight, I believe. Um, and I'm just looking forward to what sort of progress gets made this year. And, you know, it needs to hurry up and uh, be completed so we can get these two vehicles online and have something else other than the Russian Soyuz capsule. Because uh, with the Soyuz FG rocket, they do a lot. That is the vehicle that they spend the most amount of quality control time on because it's sending up humans. So that's why the Soyuz FG has a 100% uh, success rate because they spend so much time making sure that that particular rocket and that capsule will work. Now, uh, even so, though, we're having so many problems with uh, the, the Soyuz rockets that uh, I'm really worried that some sort of a loss of life event could happen, you know, in the near future. So I'm really rooting for and looking forward to the updates from the commercial crew program to get other vehicles up and working to have some sort of alternative to just relying on the Russian Soyuz vehicle. So I think that's what I'm looking forward to most, uh, other than, of course, Falcon Heavy. <laughs> Dutta? Virgin Galactic flying. Mm. Mm. Well, so they flew like today. What, what do you mean by flying? Well, they're, they're six months out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Uh, it no, it I feels mean, like they are getting closer to. Be yeah, they, they 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 did their. They've done what four captive flights. They did a, a free fall flight this morning. Um, they're they're getting back on the saddle, as it were, and I'm I'm actually looking forward to the, to seeing. Yeah. How they progress and watching them mature and figure out better, safer ways to do things and continue their test for, test program and I, I'm I was there for the original the second qualification flight for the X Prize mm -hmm. when when the the spaceship one did its its uh, parabolic flight and it's been a long time coming. I've been really excited about seeing 
what the next step was, and they they keep pushing it for obviously for safety reasons because the, you know the, their their technology isn't isn't matured. But I'm I'm really looking forward to to finally seeing them actually do the thing. That was two thousand six. Two thousand four. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Ann. Uh, I I uh, wasn't positive. Uh, that I was getting my dates correct, mm -hmm. but thankfully everybody in the chat room kept shouting a whole bunch of acronyms, and I recognized what they were, <laughs> and so I'm going to go with those. Uh, there's the GLXP and the SLS, so I'm <laughs> super excited for uh, SLS, which is the Space, Space Launch, Launch System. Yep. I very nearly did say Senate Launch System. Uh, to <laughs> fire or not fire or blow over or is blow up. Is that still happening in 2017, though? Go go no, it's pushed push back. It's pushed back, but there's a lot of qualification work that sure. is. Yeah, 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 there's a lot fair. of milestones so, that, that, are, that are being work, Very worked Very important towards milestones. Yeah. In 2017. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to see whether or not that gets canceled. I'm super excited to see whether or not that gets dismantled. I get, I'm super excited to see whether or not that gets pushed forward. Who knows? Maybe we're gonna strap twenty seven engines to SLS. Like I don't I don't know. <laughs> that I, would be I, all sort of, actually that would be even more awesome. I'm that would be incredible. Crazy fascinated with what could possibly happen with this now. Just a bunch of Especially considering the transition to the uh, Trump administration. There's so many things. It, yeah. I don't think anyone knows. I, I think we could take a bunch of uh, Dungeons and Dragons dice and just roll. And just <laughs> should pretend that somebody knows something. Oh, Nat uh, twenty. Exactly, Chris. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but but on a slightly more serious note, and and something that is a little bit more near and dear to my heart, the Google Learner X Prize, mm. uh, GLXP. I, you know, f someone in America going back to the moon, right? Sure. So yeah. Uh, uh, yeah Why does I, that have to be America though? Does it? It doesn't. It it doesn't. Uh, but someone going back to the moon. Yeah, well, because I, I, I say it like that because I guess because other countries have gone back to the moon, mm -hmm. have put other rovers on the moon or... Uh, yeah, China, you know, JAXA, yeah. Yeah, and have produced some really amazing things. Uh, this particular, you know, I guess, no, you're right. I, I apologize. Google Lunar X Prize, just because X Prize is based in America does not mean that... So all the teams come... Yes, yeah. yeah, so uh -huh. I, I strike that from the record. I apologize. Uh, what I just mean is that, yeah, you're right. So somebody going back to the moon. And with... The whole Google Lunar X Prize is getting a rover onto the moon and taking pictures and roving and staying overnight and sending information back, and it's a it's a proof of concept sort of situation going on for commercial space. I think that's the interesting thing. Yeah. Is this, it, this will be the first time that I'm aware of that a government's not doing it. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that there has been another. Can anyone? There hasn't been any other time that a commercial entity has done it. No. Yeah. So not that'll that be. I can think of. Yeah. I can't. I can't think of a commercial entity uh, doing a mission specifically beyond uh, geosynchronous orbit. So that'll so. be that. You're right. That'll be absolutely incredible. Yeah. Right. That's the part I'm excited about. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to offend. That's not what I meant. Uh, but yeah. So no. Those those two things I, I am actually quite excited about. Uh, and then in 2017, I'm the last one, right? Yep. Uh, uh -huh. So for 2017, uh, this is going to sound nerdy and self-serving a little bit, but the thing I'm most excited, si most excited about is uh, Orbit 10. Uh, a lot of what we've been working for for years now has kind of led to this next season of tomorrow. Um, the studio space, I'm actually looking at a giant graphic, uh, a 25-foot wide graphic. Well. What was a 25 foot wide graphic on a wall? <laughs> uh, for those patrons, I do recommend logging into patreon.com slash tmro and taking a peek. We have pictures of the set when it went up and then fell back down. Um, those, yes. are, uh, those are all sorts of incredible. We're getting it fixed. No fault uh, of our own. No fault of our own, but it, it'll be fixed. Um, so. Uh, so the new set's going to be incredible. We've been working this year diligently on tweaking the format to find something that works, and we're very close, if not have found it. Um, I mean, we're, we're really working hard uh, and working very long hours to try to make this something absolutely incredible for Orbit 10. And I'm very, very, very excited to see what we're able to do at that point and hopefully yeah. help continue to get humanity excited about visiting the stars and exploring the stars and doing things out in the solar system more so than just, I have problems down here, getting people to look up. 
Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, that's why we're here. We want everyone here to look up. Obviously, you're watching the show, you're looking up, uh, but we want to get more people to look up. Whether they watch the show or not is irrelevant. I just want to inspire the planet to look up. And um, uh, I, I'm, I, I am so excited for what we are building and what we have been building for the last while. And uh, that, that's what I'm most excited about for 2017 is uh, what we're able to do from there. We're going to continue to do amazing things in space. We're going to continue to land rockets. We're going to continue to create innovative new launch systems. We're going to continue to put, uh, push commercial crew, uh, be it uh, uh, SpaceX, Boeing, Virgin, x uh whatever, these micro-satellite launchers, launchers, rocket labs, all of these companies I'm super excited for, and I'm really excited to be able to bring them on this show and talk about the incredible things that they're doing and take an optimistic look at the future. That's what we do here, optimistic look at the future. All right, um, I don't think I'm gonna take a break because the show's gone long enough, and I do wanna get to a couple of comments. So uh, last week's uh, show was JP Aerospace, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the balloon castles in the sky. Uh, <laughs> let's start with, uh, let's see here, give me one second here. Ben has decided to be Capcom this week. Uh, well, I'm going to tell, we're going to jump around. Yep. Um, let's start with Hans 611. All right. That's uh, comment three, Dada. The first comment that Ben <laughs> has chosen for us today. <laughs> with an incredible icon. That's, it's so happy. Check this out. It is. It's so happy. Uh, it's from Hans 611. This <laughs> one comes <laughs> off of YouTube. <laughs> it says, uh, I feel while you child, right? I feel while everyone is playing with candles, we have these few lunatics like this guy and the EDM or EDM. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to use electronic dance music to get us to space. Well, we should. Uh, and the EM drive guys, etc. And then, like two hundred years from now, they'll look back and be like, "Oh." Maybe like the EM drive oh. stuff is starting to look more and more realistic. Possibly, right? The the the. It, we're still out on that one, but there's an article being published for peer review, so it's actually moving forward, like yeah. in a scientific, a for realsy scientific manner. Doesn't mean that it's valid yet, but it does mean no. that things are continuing to move at a forward pace, it's going uh, the even right though, way. even though it seems seemingly breaks physics as we know it. But you know what? The best kind of physics is the stuff that breaks physics as we know it, because that means that uh -huh. we didn't know everything that we thought we knew. And it's completely possible that there is something that we don't know that actually um, uh, will help us in the future. Yeah. Uh, it's also completely possible that, nope, 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 it breaks things that you can't do that, it doesn't work. Don't know yet. So that'll be cool. That'd be cool. What's the next comment that you would like to discuss, Benjamin James? <laughs> uh, let's just continue down in order from there. All right. <laughs> so after that, this one comes from Shiro off of Reddit. Says, uh, usually I don't think much of air launch systems, strato, a virgin, etc. But this was a surprisingly fascinating interview. I hope they can scale these balloons up, though. I suspect the hypersonic flutter problem might be a tough one to solve. Uh, yeah. Getting a balloon to go... Mach 10. Fast. Mach 10. It's difficult. He really liked to use Mach numbers and thought that that was a simple way to describe it. I think that's actually a very complex way to describe it. Because you have to then explain the speed of sound through air density and how it changes. And I, I, and then you have to explain, well, it's Mach 10 at sea level. So I don't... Ground speed Mach 10. Yeah, ground, well, at, well, sea level Mach 10. Well, your ground, the speed at which you're going across the ground is at Mach 10, ground speed. Yeah, but your ground changes altitude, so your pressure you're, changes, so your correct. Mach number changes. Am I thinking of something different then? Okay, they yeah. can. Am I confused can myself? Yeah, they can I have confused enough. myself. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, ha yeah, because the speed of sound changes with air density, right? So even if you're thinking ground speed, if it's the ground in a mountain, that that speed of sound is different at a mountaintop as it is at sea level. So you have to refer to uh, s speed of sound at sea level as opposed to. I guess when I talk about ground speed, I'm talking about the actual physical speed by which you are moving, uh, actually moving. Yes, so. but it would be. Physical speed at which you're moving, if, if you're referring to Mach 10, uh -huh. it would have to be physical speed at which you're moving at sea level specifically. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Right, because in your scenario, you're not taking, you wouldn't take into account the altitude because mm -hmm. you could say ground speed, but you could mean ground speed in what is it, Colorado? No, not Colorado. Um, yeah, Colorado's Colorado. high. Yeah, Colorado. You have to change your baking, the way you bake things in Colorado because right. you're so flipping high. Right, so yeah. the, the ground speed, the, grounds, the speed of sound at ground speed 
at the ground in Colorado is different than the speed of sound at, say, Cape Canaveral. Yes. There you go. Right. At, at, since gro at ground no sound level. In space, since there's no sound in space, wouldn't the uh, speed of sound up there be zero? So I don't think, I don't think it's actually, there's no, because the, the, there's this common myth that there's nothing in space. And that's not true either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is actually very distant things. So I don't know what that translates to the speed of sound. But it's, a, it's a whole lot of very little. It's a whole lot of almost nothing. <laughs> a whole lot that of very is little. Accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. anyhow, there you go. So I, I didn't. Uh, I don't know how I diverted there, but all right, there you go. Last, finally, let's close this. <laughs> uh, so this year, I think we've had either it's very close to the most number of shows or uh, the most number of shows, and this, I believe, will be our longest show <laughs> ever. Uh, but all right, uh, last comment. Wait, did you want to do the last comment? There's two. Oh after, wait, there are two. That's why I'm asking. Oh yeah, let's do last two. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, see. I didn't see the page break. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. The two is fine. Okay. Uh, this one also comes off of YouTube. This is from I don't know that I can pronounce this. Aristides Lucas, Lycus. Okay. Is it Aristides, 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 sure. Lycus. Sounds sorry good. Sorry for butchering your name. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, John Powell's configuration is an excellent way to send payloads from the surface of Mars to the solar system. John Powell's configuration is probably the only way all the dreams for human presence to Mars can be redeemed. Colonization of a planet without a magnetosphere like Mars is kind of a joke. Um. Mm. I mean, I do really like the idea of launching rockets from one of these large uh, balloon platforms. It's a balloon um, castle, Mike. Yeah, a balloon <laughs> castle. Excuse me. So uh, launching a rocket from the yard of the balloon castle. I hope my terminology is right there for you, Ben. I think that that's a really cool idea. And even if you can't um, get over some of the uh, engineering problems to actually put one of these balloon castles into orbit, from that altitude, even from the altitude of that they are sending their balloons at right now, where they're taking, you know, they're sending up those ponds, pong sats or sending up chairs for IKEA to take a really awesome video of, even from that altitude, launching a rocket from that point, you really don't need this really, you know, giant, huge configuration to, you know, launch the certain amount of weight. I mean, there are, there are a lot of benefits of being able to launch stuff from that higher altitude and, and uh, less atmosphere and get things into orbit for a lot cheaper. So that's what I'm probably the most excited about with uh, John Powell's plan is to eventually, once they have these larger balloons, to have some sort of platform that they would be able to launch small rockets from. I mean, just imagine like a sounding rocket, a small sounding rocket would be able to get something to the moon from that altitude. So uh, it's just a, a, lots of possibilities and my head kind of explodes with all the uh, cool things that you could potentially do with that. But so, it's not the I don't only... know if it's the only way that yeah. It's definitely not the only way, but it's one of the ways that we could do a lot of cool things in space. All right. Also, uh, my opinion. Be before we move on to the last comment, I did want to well caffeinated the room. Uh, caffeinated uh, back when the show, uh, apt timing, because let's make this particular show longer. Back when the show was in uh, Minnesota, caffeinated was our technical director, and we ran the show out of his. Um, a coffee shop, the yeah. Crow River Coffee Company, and we even had Blast Off Blend Coffee back when we were Space Vidcast. Uh, he was an integral part of getting us to Orbit 10. Uh, so a huge thank you to Caffeinated, and welcome back. Good to see you in the chat room. Uh, all sorts of awesome. Uh, all right, and our final comment from uh, last week's show. Uh, this one also comes off of YouTube. This is from Luke S. Van Hoort. Hoot? Hoot? Hood? Hood. Mm -hmm. Hood? You so think I'd be able to pronounce it better uh, that way. So I'll text. <clears throat> it says, the idea of quote-unquote launching a balloon instead of a rocket inspires me a lot. I'm actually working on a pretty efficient concept for an airship. However, this kind of work is not my specialization, but I'm quite sure that it'll work somehow. That's why I have quite a few questions to ask. And yes, of course, I want to share my concept. Perhaps it will give John new ideas as well. Anyway, I did my research regarding my concept, but I... Never got it to JP Aerospace. I never, yeah, I never got to JP Aerospace. There we go. Uh, once again, thanks a lot tomorrow for the great info. I will certainly try and get in touch with John. Yeah, uh, you know, that's I why think, we're here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the more people, I would also argue if you've got a really good idea, do it. Find a way to execute on it. I think that's uh, more people doing stuff. Yeah. Not everyone will be successful, but more people doing stuff increases, increases the chance of success if that makes any sense. Yes. All right, um, uh, Capcom, why don't you take us out? Yeah, all right.
right. Uh, if I may, if yes, I may, please. I did just want to say real quickly, uh, the very first comment that we squipped, I just want to read this real quick. Carrie Ann is rad. <laughs> After I dark. love having no. a fellow ladies' this... perspective. No. Carrie Ann is rad, and she deserves all of that respect. So uh, we'll, we'll talk Sorry. on that. Uh, just yeah, had I, to say that. Uh, it, it, we did <laughs> give it. Uh, we'll talk on that in After Dark. Um, yeah. Um, next week's guest, and takes a break. Uh, yeah, so next week's guest is actually Justin Park from intergalacticeducation.com. I suggest you look into the website. It's actually very interesting. Uh, and then that way you guys can be prepared for our questions for next week's show, which right. will be 9.40. Oh, my God. So exciting. Anyway, stay with us. We'll get back to you with more things in After Dark. <laughs>